I'm Robert Bracey. I am the member of staff in the department responsible for ancient South and Central Asian coins. And the reason I'm speaking to you here in a medieval numismatic week is because I work on die studies. Uh, die studies are a particular sort of numismatic technique and they apply to most numismatics. There are four basic ways to make coins. Barry's already mentioned them. They are punching, casting, striking and milling. Modern coins are all basically milled and for most of the world, for most of its history, on the major caveat that you exclude China, most coins were struck and it's striking that I'm going to be talking about. You have a couple of handouts and I will mention them in a second but the one that you want right at the moment that I'm going to bring your attention to has this symbol here. When that symbol appears on the screen there is a corresponding question on the handout for you to think about. So when we get to that point I want you to be thinking about that question and to try and put an answer down. I don't necessarily expect you to get the right answer but I want you to think about what the answer might be. And this is two of my colleagues doing a die study uh, on this table. The first thing to say is we're going to hand round some medieval dies. You have the obverse die. That's the word. This will be the one with the big spike in that you can feel free to pick them up and pass them along. Be careful with them, but you know, they're, they're reasonably robust. You're not going to accidentally snap them. The obverse die, the die that goes into the workstation, has a spike on the bottom of it. The reverse die you can see is mushroomed over on the top. And that's the effect of the repeated hammer blows on top of it. These dies survive. We have a number of examples in the museum. There are considerably more examples in the public records office. It's relatively unusual for dies to survive. These are some of the public records office dies on the screen. It's unusual for them to survive because in the world of counterfeiting, the die is the single most valuable thing the mint has. It is absolutely vital this does not fall into the hands of somebody who might wish to abuse it because this is the tool that actually makes the coins. So mints destroyed them. So when I say we're doing die study, die studies are not about studying dies because we don't have those. Die studies are about what we can do in terms of understanding dies given that we have coins. So what is a die study in a sort of general philosophical sense? Um, a lot of people approaching a die study within the numismatic world view them as extremely time consuming, very difficult, very esoteric elements in numismatic work. And I think that's not true, basically. And I'm not going to say that they're not time consuming. They certainly are, but they are absolutely central. And the reason that this talk has been put right up front at the beginning is because at least one of my colleagues who organizes the program agrees with me. Numismatics is essentially taxonomic. It's about categories categorizing coins, dividing them into series, dividing them into types. The die study is the lowest step you can take. You can subdivide a group of coins by the tool that was used to make them. They are a useful form of quantification. If you read anything from the 1980s, early 1990s on die studies and the theory of die studies, what you will hear is, oh yes, it's about quantification. It gives us the kind of economic numbers that we have in the modern world but we don't have in the medieval world. We're going to be able to do proper economic history using this. So it very much in the 1980s and 1990s, it was thought of in those sorts of terms. It is also a form of micro history. It is a way in which we can invest an enormous amount of time looking at a very, very small bit of the past. So we can spend a whole book looking at what one particular mint was doing over a course of four or five years. There's maybe only 20 people involved there. So there's just 20 people in the past over the course of their lifetime. We can analyze and study that in a lot of detail. And we can do that because while dies don't survive in any significant numbers, lots and lots of coins survive. And we can reconstruct a lot of information about the dies from them. And we can infer a lot of information from the dies about the people who used them. And finally, I would suggest, and this is why we've put it up front, 
it is a definitive technique of numismatics. Getting your head around thinking about die studies and taking that into the rest of the course is going to mean that you are thinking like a numismatist from inside looking at the way numismatic sources work rather than thinking like a historian looking from outside into a source specialism. And if you are a numismatist, you need to understand die studies. If you don't understand die studies, then really I would suggest you're not really a numismatist. So you might never do a die study, but the understanding of what a die study involved involves is central to understanding much of the rest of numismatics. So we're going to begin with the basic element of die studies. You'll notice question symbol on the bottom there. The basic element is die identity. And this was developed by uh, an American working on early modern coinages and a German so working on classical coinage. The essence of it is this. Before milled coinage, even incorporating punctures and other techniques, every die is essentially handmade, which means every die is slightly different. So if you see two coins, you can place them together, look at them, and say either, yes, those coins were struck by the same tool, or no, they were struck by a different tool. Being struck by the same tool, we refer to as die identity. Two coins share a die identity if they were made by the same die. There's a coin on the left-hand side here, A, and there are three coins next to it, B, C, and D. One of B, C, and D was struck by the same die as A. That, in case anybody hasn't realised or looked already, is the question. One of the things to look for is to try and find lines on the coins, extend those lines in your mind's eye to other parts of the coins and see where different elements are in relation to each other. And what you need to do is you build a mental map of the coin as you look and say, OK, can I work out whether or not these two coins are from the same thing? Die studies consist of a lot of different parts. We're not going to cover all of them because I only have 30 minutes. We're going to cover the four central components of a die study. The die corpus. This is the, the, the data that you assemble and create from the coins, which you can then interpret. Uh, this is the bit that's time consuming. We're then going to cover three different sorts of analysis. Metadie analysis. In a metadie analysis, you look at the whole body of the corpus and you look at it statistically and you ask questions about it at the level of the entire corpus. So if you study all of the coins of a particular king, you answer questions about the coinage across the king's reign. Interdie analysis is about looking at the relationships between different dies that the study has set up for you. Which dies were used with which? Why were certain dies used at certain times? Intradie analysis is the geekiest bit of die studies, and we're already in a pretty geeky part of numismatics here. In intradie analysis, you're not satisfied merely to look at one coinage in minute detail. What you do is you identify a single die, and you look at the history of that one tool. So I'm going to start with the die corpus. I've already said to you the die corpus is the raw data that you need in order to do a die study. Here is an example of a page from a die corpus. And this is a corpus of, I can't remember what this is called. Is this Bury St. Edmunds? Right, it might be Bury St. Edmunds. But this particular group of coins are from the reign of Stephen. The purpose of the die corpus is to essentially work through all the coins that you know about and look to see how many ident die identities you can find and essentially assign a number to every obverse die and every reverse die. And sometimes it's a letter, sometimes it's a number. Uh, you'll notice the question symbol is back. I hope everybody's looking at their sheet to know what they're supposed to have the answer to at the end. You identify every die and you identify every combination of dies. Now, is everybody happy for me to press the button and go on to the next slide? Once you've done that, and that is incredibly time because it was really easy to explain. Took me a few minutes. Does not take a few minutes to do. A die corpus of a few hundred coins is doable in a weekend. 
Die corpus of five or six hundred coins, a couple of months. Die corpus of a thousand coins, take you about a year and a half, two years of research work. A die corpus of three to four thousand coins will take you most of your career. Okay? We're going to look at meta die analysis. This is analyzing coins statistically once you've got the data. And so the data that we have, we denote by lowercase letters. Number of coins, number of obverse dies, number of reverse dies. We know all of those. That's the data we get by producing our die corpus. We want to know how many of those things there were in the past. So we denote those by uppercase letters, N, D, O, D, R the number of coins that were actually made, and the number of obverse and reverse dies they were made from. At the bottom, we have two different medieval coins, and the results of die studies that have been done on them. So, short cross, class five pennies. There we are. Barry showed you what Western European medieval penny looked like. This looks grottier, but pretty similar. This one actually comes from the Portable Antiquities Scheme, uh, find in a, a, a stray find in the UK. The number of coins, so there's 1,369 of these known when the person did the die study, and they found 211 obverse dies and 317 reverse dies amongst those over 1,300 coins. This is a Boyard Dirham. Um, I, Barry didn't really cover this, but the medieval world essentially has a division between the coinage as it appears in Europe and Western and to the western end of the Mediterranean Europe, and then as you move east, you get Arab coinage, coinage based on the Arab tradition, which looks quite different. And uh, colleagues of mine later will explain to you the details of what those look like. And this is taken from a die study of of the Buyid coinage. So there was a question there. I hope everybody had an opportunity to look at the question. How big is the coinage? Well, we can't actually reconstruct n the number of coins that were actually made using die studies. We'd like to. In theory, it's possible. In practice, we don't have enough data to work from the surviving, the number of dies to the number of coins. A number of people have tried, but, and, and at some point in the future, we will be able to do this, but today, right now, we can't. What we can do, we have a number of mathematical formulas for this all relatively simple. I picked the easiest one to remember. Actually, this is generally the formula preferred in the classical world. Um, medieval studies tend to prefer a slightly different formula. But use this to take the number of coins that you have and the number of dies that you know about, and you extrapolate from them the number of dies you think there were. Part of the reason that we can't then work from having that number of dies to having the number of coins is that the number of coins a die make varies enormously. This is a scatter graph of medieval mints, late medieval mints, that we have records for. And you can see that the average output of a mint per die varies between under 10,000 and over 70,000. We don't understand enough about how long a die was used for and what affected its useful life to extrapolate from the number of dies to the number of coins. At least we've got that information. I mean, bear in mind, for most of the world, we don't have that sort of data to begin with. So we're completely in the dark. We don't even know how wrong our uh, incorrect guesses might be. But we can use numbers. Now, I did mention it would take almost your entire lifetime to do a three or 4,000 coin die study. Uh, this person did one on these coins here. And in the process, it should be said, added significantly to the, the theoretical understanding of die studies. This is a, a medieval numismatics, probably biggest contribution to the, uh, to the subject. And I'm not even going to mention the actual bit she contributed towards. I'm going to show you the statistical thing instead. What she did was she looked at hordes of coins. She had her die study, and she looked within each hoard how many coins in that hoard shared a die identity with another coin in the same hoard. So how tight was the hoard in terms of, of its, its die linkage? And these are the hoards. These are their dates. This is the number of coins 
this is the percentage of those coins that shared a identity. Now ignore the bottom two for a second and look at the top four, which are within Scandinavia. This follows the pattern we would expect. The more coins within the hoard that share a die identity with another coin, the less well circulated the coinages are. If you imagine, when they leave the mint, they're going to leave in a batch. And most of the coins are going to share die identities because they're going to have been made at a workstation using the same tools right, in a short period. Once they're out in circulation, you'll spend some of the money, you'll get some money in change. The money you get in change won't use the same die as the ones you already have. The longer the coins are out there, the fewer die identities they're likely to share. And that is, in fact, what generally happens. However, these last two are much, much later. But their proportion of die identities is quite high. These last two are from Russia rather than from Scandinavia. And this was part of the evidence that Britta Marma presented to show that the Russian circulation of these Scandinavian coins was much slower. Right? These coins left Scandinavia, they moved to Russia, but then within Russia they simply weren't exchanged. They didn't operate as coinage as frequently and as easily as they had in Scandinavia. So they were much more static in their circulation. This is the kind of data that you can extract using a die study at this sort of level. You'll notice we haven't even looked at any individual dies here. We've just looked at the total numbers of dies and the total numbers of coins. So that's probably the easiest sort of data to extract from a die study. But if your die study is quite good, if it's relatively complete, you can move on a step and you can look at the inter-die analysis. And this is the relationships between different dies. Generally speaking, we display these as um, network diagrams like these, known as graphs, because technically in mathematics, that, that's a graph. Okay? So you don't need to care or know why, but if somebody refers to them as a graph, you, you know what you're looking at. The simplest sort of chart is a die combination. Imagine a, a single coin has an obverse die and a reverse die. So the single coin is evidence that those two tools were used together. If that's the only coin you've got, you have a die combination. Die combinations are dull and uninteresting, and we can't tell anything from them. Sometimes a single obverse die might be known from several different coins, and each of those coins might have a different reverse die. So that is an isolated obverse die, and the reverse dies are die-linked. That might be interesting if the reverse dies are radically different, you know, if we get two totally different reverse dies we thought were from different places. Oh, no, no, they're from one place. That's, that's quite interesting. Potentially. Usually that's pretty dull. Then we get die groups. This is, these are cases where we have a network that's all connected together. It contains multiple obverses. It contains multiple reverses. This is what generally interests us. And it interests us because the structure of the links implies things about the organization of the mint. And this is an example, a hypothetical example of what we call a single workstation. There's an obverse, a set of obverse dies, a set of reverse dies. They're used sequentially. Imagine Ben at the front here making coins, and we make him make coins every day for months and months and months. He'll break the reverse die eventually because he's hitting it with a hammer. And we'll have to give him a new reverse die. And then eventually he'll break that. And then maybe he'll break the obverse die. And that's what's happening here. The, the obverse die is being replaced when it's broken. The reverse die is being replaced when it's broken. They're being paired together as they go along. We see that in the coinage. And then we have a two workstation group. Now you have to really use your imagination. Imagine two bends at the front. And they both have a workstation. On their workstation is an obverse die. And on the other workstation is another obverse die. So Ben A's obverse die and Ben B's obverse die. Then I have a little box, and in the box are two reverse dies. And each morning I come in and I say, take a reverse die, and they take a reverse die and they use it at the workstation. Then I take them back at the end of the day, and then I bring them back the next day, and they might take the other reverse die. So the reverse dies can be shared between the two workstations. And so we get a different sort of visual pattern. Analyzing this data is about analyzing visual patterns. Uh, and I'm going to show you one. I'm going to show you one. This is an example from what we call Arab Byzantine coinage. This is seventh century coinage struck in Syria immediately after the Islamic conquest, but made 
using the designs that were in use on Byzantine coins in the area already. This is a published die chart by Tony Goodwin. I've included a lot of data here. There's the die numbers, and then there are various type designations that he's given the different coins. This chart is a mess, right? What Goodwin did is he presented this data and he said, well, you can see it's not the standard single workstation model. And he said, well, we can't see it. We can't tell anything more about it than that. And to be fair, when he published this, we didn't have the theoretical tools to really tell us anything more than that. So here's the chart again. These are not the particular coins that are appearing in this diagram, but I thought you'd like some larger, nicer pictures of what these coins look like. They're Byzantine. Here's a Byzantine emperor, Roman letters. But here's a little bit of Arabic on the bottom of the coin telling us it's an Arab Byzantine coin. Again, it's a mess. Conceptually, we can't do anything with that. We can't visualize what that means, other than it's complicated. We don't know what's going on. If we move the dies in sort of terms of time, if we take die 24 and put it here in the sequence, that doesn't help. We still have lots of crisscrossing lines. So what we do is we say, well, we can't reconstruct this as a single workstation. Let's try reconstructing this as two workstations. Let's create a second workstation at the bottom move some of the obverse dies down there. Well, it's still still a mess, but it, it's a lot clearer than it was. You can begin to see, oh yeah, I, I can begin to get a sense of what's going on. There's, there's clearly sequence here. You can see that there's a some sense of what order the dies are being used in. And you can continue messing with that. And what you're looking to do mostly is to unravel the lines, to try and get as strong a sense as possible of what's going on. And we're, we're kind of nearly there here. But I'm, I'm now going to convert it back to the other diagram, which will hopefully make it uh, clear. So this is our time arrow. This is the order. These are our obverse and reverse workstations. I did give you a, a question on this section, I think. These are the actual coins that are appearing. You can see the different obverse dies and types. And you can see that this is a relatively complicated interlocking structure of, of, of lines between the obverse and the reverse, reverse dies. It would be almost impossible to reconstruct this as a single workstation without producing the sort of confusing mess we just saw, sometimes known as a spider diagram. I'm going to move on to the next section now. But interdiary analysis is conceptually relatively complex, but it's relatively quick. We have this very initial process, and this is a very this is a characteristic feature of die studies. It's something that they all suffer from. You have this initial process of the die identities, which is actually conceptually very simple, but it's enormously time consuming. Once you've got that data, it takes a relatively small period of time to analyze it, but it's often conceptually quite tricky to do so. Advances are still being made in terms of our conceptual understanding of this as we get more and more data from larger and larger die corpus and we get cases of three workstations, four workstations. We begin to understand things about the rapidity of production. If you've got more workstations, you're making coins faster. Clearly you needed to make them faster. I mean, you don't just hire extra people for the fun of it. You've got a reason for it. If we've done our meta-dianalysis and our inter analysis we might need to do intra analysis on a die corpus. And generally speaking, we need quite a good sample for this. We, you, this is not the kind of analysis that you, you do when you've looked at a few hundred coins. Um, the reason is pretty straightforward. You need four or five coins all struck by the same die before you can really say anything meaningful about what happened to that die over time. Now, the critical thing to remember is dies are subject to a considerable amount of force. You saw Ben striking that. He wasn't tapping it lightly. He was really having a go. And most ain't, and these, these medieval dies aren't made of modern machine steel. They, they can't take repeatedly being hit like that. So we get two basic types of change on the surface of a die, which are then imprinted onto the coin so we can see them. We get wear, where the, the physical forces involved simply cause the face of the die to fracture, or break, or wear out, become, become literally just fuzzier, so that we can't see what's going on. We also get cases where the engravers alter the dies, where they 
they actually take a die that's in use, they make an alteration with a tool, and then they put the die back in use. And we can see that process going on. So when we're looking at intra-die analysis, we're looking to identify these two features and to then establish the progression you see on the die. That can be incredibly complex. We can have cases where through a combination of mechanical stress and active recutting, we might have 70 or 80 coins and be able to divide them across time into 20 or 30 phases. It can be that sophisticated and that can tell us very interesting things about the other side of the coin. Because if you know exactly what order the coins were struck in and the other side of the coin changes its die, it tells you exactly what order those dies were used in. This isn't quite that sophisticated an example. This is from a study on the coins of Canute. And what appears to be going on is that there are small marks around the edge of the coin. And usually, they're pretty obviously just made with the die. But occasionally, somebody takes a tool and they gouge into the edge of the die, usually just between the ledge and slightly into the central circle, and usually over the top of something that's already there, like a small pellet. And the study that's been done of these show that these marks come in several different types, and that appears to simply relate to the tool that's being used. There's quite a lengthy discussion of this, and uh, I'm struggling to remember the name of the person who did it. I think it's Eaglin, Robin, Robin Eaglin. Uh, did a study of this with, with somebody else, and they developed quite a sophisticated argument from what might be going on in Canute's coinage. And they're able to do that because, looking at this, the people involved are destroying a mark that's already on the coin, which means they're able to establish that that mark means something to the mint. It's not simply decorative. Right? If you're deliberately removing it, it must have some functional use. Well, that's knew we, we wouldn't have known that without these marks and then these marks are mostly found at certain mints so Stamford has a lot of these marks other mints around near it have fewer and mints further away even less they are distributed unevenly amongst different moneyers so they're able to look at this and what they do is they develop an argument which I'm not going to comment on that there is a production of coinage that falls outside of the normal production and it's necessary to bring in dies that are used for other purposes and use them for this production right and they mark the dies to indicate that this is happening they mark them in such a way that it's pretty obvious they've been marked but it's primarily clearly for the administrative purposes of the people who are making coins and this is not the kind of mark that's intended for the general public. Always a great test you can do where you can ask somebody without looking what's on the back of their, their notes and they can almost never tell you. That is the case for most people in most of the world with most of the coinage they do. They, they kind of know roughly what a coin looks like. They'll, they'll notice if it looks odd, but they basically don't pay very much attention to uh, what the coins. Only numismatists and people who work in mints really look at coins very closely. I've flown through the four basic elements that make up a die study. The die corpus, the actual data that you have to work with, and then analyzing it by statistical methods, by graphs and networks, right, the relationship between dies, and by looking at the wear and the alteration of individual dies. That is a die study in a nutshell. I do not expect any of you to walk away from this talk with enough information to do a die study. I don't expect you to remember any of the details of any of the things I've explained to you. What I hope is that going into the rest of the week, you take with you an understanding of how a coin is made and the kinds of understandings we can develop by looking at coins. And one of the critical things that I've been doing here, and I, it's quite subtle, and I hope you noticed it, is Everything we learned by looking at those examples was about the mint. It was what the mint was doing. It was what the mint was making. It wasn't about kings. 
It wasn't about politics. You will frequently find in literature written by historians looking in at the source specialism that the conclusions they draw are about grand things, the grand picture of economics, the grand picture of politics of the period. What coins mostly tell us about are the people who actually made them, and the people who actually made them worked in a mint. If you want to write a history of a mint, look at a group of coins. If you want to write a political history, look at a different source. But I hope that you'll take that information into the rest of the week and that that will shape some of the ways that you're looking at the talks you're presented with. Because what we really want is not just to teach you a bit about numismatics, but is at the end of the week for you to be thinking like your numismatists. So I gave you some questions. Here are some answers. So we had these. I gave, I've given a similar talk. Um, a, what you probably realize is I work on Indian coins. Um, I don't give talks about this very often to people who work on Indian coins. But I gave a similar talk to people who worked on classical coins, and I gave them an example to do this from. Their example was much easier. If anybody got the right one here, I, I'm... First thing to look for is look for details on the coins. Now, there's a small dot just here, down on the bottom left. You can see it's there on A and D. It's not there on B. So you can eliminate B. B is not the same die. I did actually give you a bit of a clue. I put some lines through the, through the cross that's in the center for you to look at. Uh, do you see where it crosses the E here in the legend? That it, or it crosses the letter. You should be able to see a letter there. It doesn't here. The letter's higher. It does there. A and D share a die identity. You get really quite quick at this if you do a lot of die studies. I showed you some, a, a die study of Stephen. And I think on the, on the sheet I asked you how many um, coins were struck using obverse die A and reverse die A. So the person's categorized their coins with a, an uppercase letter for the obverse die and a lowercase letter for the reverse die. Uh, did, did anybody get, get that? I think that was... What you have is these are the coins listed down here with where the person found them. Right? So there's eight. There are eight coins belonging to that combination, A, A, up there. There might only be seven, because a five has been double struck. Um, so when somebody's been hammering like that, they've hit it twice with the hammer, and the coin has moved between the two strikes. So the two images have been overlaid on top of each other. And that makes the image quite confusing. It distorts it. So they can't be certain. They think it's probably this die, but they're not certain. So there's eight, or perhaps just seven. I asked you on this one, the, the, the slightly easier of the two questions, which was, which of these two groups of coins used more obverse dies in its production? And then I asked you to think about why that might not tell you anything useful about which of them made more coins. So uh, does anybody want to guess on this one? True. <laughs> but you have the right answer, but for the wrong reason. And the last time I gave this one, I gave this to classical students, what I did was I actually cheated and, and made sure that the one that was the wrong answer had the higher DO value, just so that they would, they would trip up on it. But yes, I mean, what you're looking at there is that's the number of obvious dies we have that survive today, which is not necessarily the same thing as the number of obverse dies that existed at the time. So what we can do is we can apply the formula that we've got to calculate the number of obverse dies. Here's the calculation. And there were, there were 250, roughly, for the short cross coinage. And there's 469 for the, for the Bouillard. So the Bouillard used a lot more obverse dies. The reason is that if you look, the number of coins is relatively low compared to the number of dies. Our sample is not very complete. 240 dies from 491 coins. Whereas here, there's only 211 dies. There's over 1,300 coins. You're not going to find many more dies. Because for every, every die, you've got five or six examples. For some of them, you'll have 20 or 30 examples. Is there anything we, you know, any problem we might have with then extrapolating to the number of coins? And I did explain to you, we can't really, we don't really know how many coins a die was used to make. In this particular case, there's something even, even stranger, is that the ratio of obverse dies to reverse dies is radically different between the two groups of coinage. It's nearly one-to-one -one for the Arab coinage, whereas it's 1.7 for the English coinage. It ought to be two, shouldn't it, Barry? By this stage, they're issuing two reverse dies and an obverse die to... Yeah. yeah. 
yeah. So, so it act, 1.7 is actually surprisingly low for, for, for that sort of coinage. But, but the point is that they're using very different procedures. It's very obvious. If you're, if you're issuing people with multiple reverses for every obverse that they have, it's a very different procedure to having virtually the same number. And are you doing that because actually you don't make as many coins? So you don't need to worry about the fact that the reverse is wearing out. The reverse will generally wear out first. It's taking the hammer blow. The obverse is protected by the coin itself from the hammer blow. So the reverse will wear out either because the, the die face fractures or because it simply mushrooms over so much at the other end you can't hold it any longer without hitting your hand and you'll need to replace it with a, with a new die. And then I showed you this and I, and I kind of went through very, very quickly. I didn't really give you any of the details of how we do this or why we think particular interpretations work. It's essentially a visual thing. Does this diagram look like I can make sense of it? We have two anvils, two bends, here and here, making coins. And then we have a box that I'm bringing in each morning, and it's got some dies in it. So how many dies are there in that box? Everybody at the table, hopefully, can think about it for a second and tell me what the minimum number of dies there must be in that box. Two, exactly. There have to be at least two reverse dies because there are two workstations. Actually, the diagram implies that there's slightly more than that. Um, so there are our two obverse workstations. Everybody can see those. So these obverse dies, the round circles, are being used successively at the two workstations. I've put a red line across to kind of indicate between obverse die 7 and obverse die 20 at this workstation, and obverse die 31 and obverse die 6 at this workstation. Reverse 21 is clearly being used before that red line and after the red line. Reverse 55 is being used before and after. It's used with both obverse 7 and obverse 20. Reverse 9 is being used before with all three of those dies and after with both of those dies. Reverse 6 appears down here, but it must have been used at this point here because we find it with obverse 9. So each of these lines represents at least one coin that pairs these together, maybe more than one coin. There must have been at least four reverses in use. Now, you've only got two workstations. Four reverses don't allow you to strike coins any faster. You can only use two of them at any one time. But your box that you're choosing from has four in it. Why might you do that? Well, it's quite interesting that you would do that. And one of the reasons you might do it is you might be worried about them breaking. The reverse is much more likely to break than the obverse. If it breaks and you don't have another die, you're going to have to wait six hours while somebody carves one. So have a spare. Have two spares. And then if it breaks, you can replace it with a new die. So you, absolutely, this is the... Yeah, we can go immediately to, oh, we've got two workstations, we must have at least two reverse dies. But there's no reason at all that we couldn't have more, which we usually refer to in dice as, as redundant dies. And so you can see we're beginning to develop a picture of the mint's activity, not just the order in which things were struck, not just the number of workstations, but procedural things like how many spares did you keep lying around? Right? And that's, that's quite interesting. Right? It tells us, oh, you're a little bit worried one of these might break. Let's, let's have a spare. At the very end, I put up the two different forms of... So when we're doing an intro die analysis, the two different things we're looking for. We're looking for where on the die surface, and we're looking for cases where we're recutting. And I asked you a question, which of these is more subjective? Now, the first thing to say is both of these are quite tricky to spot. Because obviously, it's not just the die that suffers from alteration or wear. The coin can suffer from alteration or wear as well. And so I'm not going to pick on anybody this time. Hopefully you all had a quick think about this. And I hope you all came to the conclusion that it's probably this that's hardest to identify because the same sorts of rubbing, blows, chips that might occur to the die face are exactly the same sort of thing that might occur to a coin that's being handled in circulation. And so it's frequently very hard. If you've just got two coins, you can't look at them and say, oh, this coin has a more worn die than this one. Because you don't know how much of that wear is on the coin and how much of that wear is on the die. You generally need quite a few coins. So you can go, oh, this little crack here, this, this little mark I can see, I know this is on the die because it's on three of the coins. 
and you don't get three identical marks on a coin simply through circulation. I'd like to thank everybody for bearing with me through that relatively rapid survey of dye studies.